are one week removed from the amazing news that UCLA and USC are joining the Big Ten, expanding the footprint of the conference from coast to coast. That is and remains our big story today. The two West Coast schools set to join the league two years from now. They'll bring incredible tradition and success to the three winningest programs all time in terms of team national championships in college sports. With the move, the Big Ten now at 16 schools, again, a footprint spanning from the Atlantic to the Pacific and covering plenty of ground in between, a truly national conference. And that gets us to today's big interview. The athletic director at UCLA, Martin Jarman, kind enough to join us. Martin, thanks so much for your time, first of all. Let's start here. What excites you the most as an AD about this move to the Big Ten? Well, Dave, it's good to be with you uh, this morning. And, you know, just excited for our student athletes, the opportunity to compete at the highest level, uh, the academic fit, the athletic excellence that's in the Big Ten, and uh, what UCLA brings to the table. I just think it's at the highest level, iron sharp as iron. And I'm excited uh, for a few years to be uh, have our student athletes be able to showcase their talents and skills across the country, you know, from the Pacific to the Atlantic. You are kind of uniquely positioned in that you know the Big Ten very well. You spent a combined 15 years at Michigan State and Ohio State. So it's not like you're going into this without an idea of what the Big Ten is all about. What makes this a good fit for UCLA? You know, I think you go back to that academic fit. I mean, just from an institution perspective, uh, the Big Ten schools are, are heavy and significant in research and and academic profile, and that's what UCLA is. So I think just from the beginning, you have to look at um, institution as far as the academic mission and the research and service, and UCLA being the number one public institution in the country, uh, most applied to school in the country, uh, academically strong, and that's what the Big Ten is. So I think you start there, and then you look at competition. Uh, you know, at UCLA, we've won 119 national championships, second most in the country. Uh, so we are, are used to competing and achieving at a high level of, of excellence. And that's what the Big Ten is. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the Big Ten, some great institutions and uh, great success. So I just think when you look at the schools in the Big Ten and you look at UCLA, there's just a lot of symmetry as far as our values and the academic mission and the pursuits and research and, um, and athletic excellence. So those are, there's many components that are very similar in our profiles. As you say, UCLA doesn't need any help in terms of name recognition, as you mentioned, most applied to school uh, of any in the country. That being said, does this change the profile of the school in any way, just the notion of going from what was a regional athletic conference to what is now a national athletic conference? Oh, absolutely. I think it elevates us, and I think it elevates the Big Ten. You know, the, the first thing that jumps out at you you know, we're in an era right now where uh, student athletes, uh, they, they want to have impact, you know, socially, uh, athletically, academically, they want to have impact. And, you know, one of the things that I'm most excited about is, is they're going to be seen more now. You know, there are a lot of times on the West Coast, you've got a, a late game time, you know, you're not going to be seen on the East Coast and in the Midwest. You're just not. And that's real. And so that impacts you as far as, whether it's awards, whether it's notoriety, whether it's brand, um, that's a significant impact. So right off the bat, you're going to have game times where you're seen more and that's a national platform. And so that's something that uh, as a West Coast school, you think about, you try to combat a lot is just trying to get your student athletes better times to be able to be seen. Uh, so that's one that that's, that's really big, just just right off the bat that we spend a lot of time on the West Coast trying to give our student athletes the best platform so that their scout, their talents and skills can be showcased. Martin, you've acknowledged reports that the UCLA athletic department was in kind of a tough spot financially. How does the outlook for the department change versus what it was, say, eight days ago? Well, I, I mean, I think, first of all, there are a lot of schools in the country, especially coming out of the pandemic, that were financially challenged. I mean, that's that's no secret or surprise. Um, there's not many uh, in the Power Five, quite frankly, that are self-sustaining in the Black on their own. 
so UCLA is very similar to a lot of schools. Um, that said, you know, anytime that you have a, a, a challenge in resources, you know, you can't invest to the levels that you want to. Uh, you can't say yes as much. You're always um, in a maintenance kind of mode. And what it does for us, it allows us to reimagine our athletic program and strategically how we invest the resources to really continue to compete at a high level. You know, you can't just stay the same. If you stay the same, you know, the competition is going to catch up. And so one of the things that I'm excited about is we'll be able to invest the resources in our student athletes, in our programming to, to address the needs of our student athletes, but also to move ahead, to be a leader, to, to get ahead of some things and to be on the cutting edge because it takes resources to win and compete. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. So um, this does improve our prospects moving forward as far as how we can invest in our student athletes and invest in success because um, to do a great job, to win, to win big, you, you gotta have resources to support that. And as you mentioned, UCLA has been incredible when it comes to winning 119 national championships. As you mentioned, uh, in terms of team sports and the Olympic sports have been fabulous. I think one of the things that is really interesting now, and as you say, You've gone a long way towards ensuring that you'll be able to continue to compete in all those Olympic sports. But one of the challenges now becomes travel, uh, particularly with some of those sports that have midweek games where you're going to have to go across a couple of time zones. How do you address that challenge in, in terms of making sure that you're able to balance the academic component with the athletic component? Yeah, we're, we definitely acknowledge that and spend a lot of time thinking through that. And and the good thing is we still have time to to try to work through some of those things. You know, the Big Ten is, is going to be great, and, and they're cognizant of adding two schools from, from L.A. and being on the West Coast. And how does that look as far as scheduling and doing things creatively? So I'm sure that there will be some things that, that I haven't even thought of that, that may be on the table as far as helping with that. And also, too, you know, we're going to invest in our academic resources and make sure that our teams have the academic support while they are on the road to make sure that they don't fall behind from a study standpoint. I think in the last two and a half years, we've seen hybrid uh, models with, with student athletes and academics and pursuits, uh, not necessarily in the classroom. Uh, you know, there's not there's not a there's not a one size fits all for this. You know, there are going to be different things that we do to try to help that uh, that travel and that transition as far as our student athletes. But um, you know, a lot of student athletes travel quite a bit. If you think about it, even before you get to college and travel ball in high school, um, they travel all over the country. So this is not something new. Um, it may be new or different compared to a conference structure of what we're used to. But as far as travel, um, that's always been a part of elite athletic competition at various levels. Would you like to see more West Coast schools added to the Big Ten? I'm just focused on UCLA. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> excited and happy about us being uh, in the Big Ten. Uh, as far as other schools, you know, I don't know whatever works for the Big Ten. But, you know, I think my focus and our attention is just really how we prepare to be uh, great partners in the league that we're in right now and, and be fully engaged. And then also with an eye toward the future, how we uh, ramp up and invest and get ready to compete in 2024 in the Big Ten. As you look at the landscape of college athletics right now, do you think we're headed toward an era of two super conferences? You know, I, I think you're headed to an era where there's two super conferences that are, or two conferences that are going to have uh, more resources and uh, a significant level of schools that are competing at the highest level. I do think that is the case. As far as super conferences, I don't know about that. Um, but I do know that if you just look at the landscape, um, it's very apparent that there are two conferences that are separating themselves, uh, and that's the Big Ten and the SEC. So I think from, from an outside looking in, uh, you want to be a part of the best, and you want to be a part of most success. And that's where, uh, at least the way it is shaping up uh, currently, it looks like there are two conferences that are really separating themselves uh, from a competition standpoint across all the sports. I want to get into your two highest profile sports just to give Big Ten fans a, a sense of where things stand. Let's start with football. A really good turnaround year last year for Chip Kelly. It felt like maybe the offense was starting to click and, and things were starting to settle in in the way that might have been anticipated when he was hired. How would you assess the state of the rebuild of football? I think football is on a great trajectory right now. As you mentioned, we, we went eight and four last year. Um, had a successful run, top 15 offense in the country, and 
Uh, I think we made plays on both sides of the ball and special teams had some significant wins last year. Uh, and so I think that the momentum and energy with our football program is great. Chip Kelly does a great job. Uh, everybody knows that he does things the right way. He's very innovative, obviously, offensively. Um, but I, I think his leadership skills as a CEO and just running the program and how those young men respond to him and, and how he feels about him and cares about him. I mean, he's the kind of guy that you want leading your program. And uh, I'm excited about, about him. And, and we signed him to an extension after the season. And, uh, you know, the future is bright. Uh, we look to build on that momentum of that eight wins last year and, and continue to, to move forward in a positive way. You signed Mick Cronin on the basketball side to a long-term deal as well. And it's interesting, you're a former basketball player yourself. Mick is not a coach you hired, but clearly you feel really good about him and, and understandably so given the success here of the past couple of years. UCLA has such a rich basketball tradition. What do you think, what, what makes Mick kind of the right guy to, to lead you into the future here? You know, again, it starts with leadership, and, and Mick is a, is a great leader. You know, uh, I think the world of Mick, you know, he's tough. He loves tough. He coaches tough. Uh, but you can tell by the guys how they respond to him that they really have a mutual love and respect for one another. Um, again, he's a CEO. He gets the big picture, uh, and, and I'm excited about, about just what he's going to be able to do because he's still early in his tenure in, in Westwood at UCLA. Uh, but he's just he, he, he's hard, tough. He's uh, he, he grinds it out and, and he he knows how to to run a program offensively, defensively um, intense that people can be proud of. And, and the thing that I love about him, too, is, you know, uh, being the head coach at UCLA men's basketball is not easy. Uh, there are a lot of expectations. Uh, there's a lot of obviously the history, the most national championships in the country. He embraces that. He embraces the legend of, of, of Coach Wooden and, and the pyramid and what that means to to our fans and college basketball. And, you know, he's focused every day on how does he get number 12, that, that 12th national championship in men's basketball. And he wears those four letters. He embraces the expectations. Uh, and I think he enjoys that. And, and that's not for everybody. That kind of pressure is not for everybody. It's for Mick Cronin. And that's why we're, we're glad to have him. Well, we are glad to have UCLA. I, I know Big Ten fans are thrilled about the notion of Pauley Pavilion being a, a Big Ten <laughs> venue, the Rose Bowl. I mean, it's really, it's amazing, Martin. Give Big Ten fans, though, finally, a, a sense of what they are getting with UCLA from the point of view of an athletic department, a school, a fan base. What should Big Ten fans expect here a couple years from now? Well, you're getting elite excellence. We talk about elite um, as a mindset, energy, leadership, integrity, toughness, and excellence. Uh, UCLA, we do it things the right way. Uh, we compete at a high level. Uh, we're serious academically and athletically. And um, anytime that you come to UCLA, you know, you're going to get um, people to treat you the right way, sportsmanship, number one. Um, and we achieve at a high level. Um, there's a lot of tradition and pride of being a Bruin. And that's what our fans feel as well. Um, I think the, uh, the Midwest and East Coast fans that come out to L.A. will get great weather, will, will be treated well, and, um, and it's going to be great competition. You know, we bring it. And so uh, it, it's going to be exciting. Um, you know, we're, we're bringing a lot of juice to the Big Ten and, and vice versa. I think it will elevate us as well. Again, iron sharpens iron. So I think uh, the Big Ten fans will be very impressed when they come out to Westwood. Well, cannot wait to get out there. You mentioned the weather. That's certainly part of it <laughs> <laughs> for the anticipation here. But it, it's far from the only thing. It just feels like such an incredible fit. Martin Jarman, the athletic director at UCLA, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And, and looking forward to working with you here in the days and years to come. Dave, I appreciate it and look forward to, to seeing you in person and getting there someday. Just amazing to think what the Big Ten is getting with the addition of USC football. The school's seven Heisman winners tied for first all time with Ohio State, among others. Also in the top five in terms of draft picks, national titles, weeks at number one, and All-Americans. Phenomenal program. Uh, here to help add some perspective, my friend and colleague Joshua Perry. Uh, Joshua, first blush here. USC, UCLA, what's the Big Ten getting football-wise? Uh, they're getting a ton of legacy, and, and they're getting some really good cachet as well from uh, the product that you're getting on the field right now. As you start to look back, and we just had that graphic up, 
teams that have produced a lot of first round draft picks. We're talking about national championship pedigree out there on the West Coast. So I, I think that's a, a really important thing to acknowledge here is you're bringing in some really quality programs that understand some of the traditions that go along with college football. It's funny because, you know, you see these two brands and the first thing that I think about is Rose Bowls. You know, you think about that legacy that the Big Ten has with the Pac-12 and some of these brands. Now you get to just bring that into your conference and we get to live those moments. It's going to be fun on Saturdays when we see the aerial shots of the stadiums with those colors in there. Uh, absolutely an awesome moment. Um, and, and so it's, it, this is really exciting just because of the cachet that you get to bring in here. Um, nostalgia, everything that's involved. But like I said, programs right now that feel like they're in a moment where they're getting ready to take that next step on the football field as well. How do you think it changes the perception of the conference? Well, I, I think that this really opens things up. And I know last year there was a lot of conversation about the SEC and some of the moves that they made to bring in Texas and Oklahoma. And now they were on the forefront of this new college football frontier. The Big Ten is right there as well as a conference. And so I think that adds a lot of credibility to what this conference is doing. And you can start to go now and look at some of the brands that exist here. You got the Ohio States, the Michigans, Michigan States, Wisconsin, Iowa, Nebraska. And then you bring in UCLA and USC. We're talking some of the greatest brands in the college athletic space that are going to be in the Big Ten. It's interesting you talk about it in terms of brands. And I do think that there is a lot of that in this day and age of college sports. And I mean, these are instantly recognizable programs. I said this the day they joined the league, but you turn on the TV and obviously we got the bottom line and the bugs mm -hmm. and whatnot, and you always know the score <laughs> and who's playing. But let's say that was out and you turned on the TV and you saw USC or you saw UCLA, you know who they are without needing to look at the score bug. You know who's playing. I mean, these are instantly recognizable yes, programs. No, you look at the jerseys, you look at yep. the helmets, you know exactly what it is. And you also know what to expect out of it, too. You know that you're going to get a good football game. You know that you're going to pan the sidelines and see some of the former players, maybe a <laughs> former coach yeah. or two. And that's always fun. But like I said, this is huge, not just from a, a credibility of the conference standpoint. We're getting into a really unique time in college athletics. But this is going to be a really good move for athletics, football, uh, basketball. But we can also talk about the Olympic sports as well. And the Big Ten Conference values that aspect in their athletic departments. The Olympic sports have done a really good job. We're talking about two teams that have won a ton of titles in sports that are not uh, men's uh, basketball and college football. So that's going to be a really good addition for the Big Ten there as well. What about recruiting? Like if you're a, a recruit from the Midwest, let's say, as you were, mm -hmm. uh, you were an in-state kid in Ohio. And as soon as Ohio State offered, you, you were going to go no matter who it was they were playing. But does it become more appealing the notion that, that we can go out and play conference games in the Rose Bowl or the Coliseum? And, and is the inverse true? I mean, are, are players more likely to sign with USC or UCLA with the notion of going to play at the Big House or the Shoe or wherever it might be? I think this opens up recruiting a ton. And I, my, my, my backup school, which I like to say, was Stanford. But the hardest thing about going out there as a kid from the Midwest is my parents would not have been able to get out to games. And some of the games would have been tough to see on television. Now you can really say if you're recruiting a kid from the Midwest, if you're USC or UCLA, that there are going to be uh, away games that your parents have proximity to. They can get to some of those games so they could see you for maybe half the season. But also when you start to look at television, it's going to be a little bit easier because hopefully some of these games are going to be played on the same time zone that these kids are from. And so you can use that. The same thing is true if you're going out to the West Coast as well. Now that opens things up for some of these Midwestern schools. Uh, college football at the top level is national in terms of recruiting, but it really boils down to regions. And now that you've expanded out to the West, you've opened some of those regions up to where these schools are going to be in some really competitive recruiting battles. Uh, they're going to be back and forth. And I think for a lot of families, it's easier to make that decision going from the Midwest to the West Coast or even all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast just because everything is now going to be, you know, you get some away games that are going to be close. And then, um, you know, television will probably be a little bit easier too. What's your sense of where all this is going in terms of the conferences and the realignment and the consolidation and just this kind of unease, I think, for some people in terms of, of figuring out what the landscape's going to be five or ten years from now? I, I think we're seeing it's a, a mad dash right now to try to build up these super conferences. And, um, you know, I mentioned the SEC earlier grabbing uh, two of the, the greatest brands in college football in Texas and Oklahoma uh, to come into their conference. I'm not sure they're done with their expansion. And, uh, you look at this Big Ten conference right now going out and getting U USC and UCLA, which were two huge gets. 
you know, people are going to ask the question, what comes down the road? And so now you're starting to see these conferences are building up. The other ones are kind of being deteriorated right now, and there are some, some decisions that have to be made at an administrative level. But I think that we're looking now at a, a college football landscape, at least, where you're going to have a couple of super conferences. Um, people have been talking about playoff expansion for a while. I think that becomes a part of it. And I think in order to really compete at the highest level, uh, there's going to be some more movement to get the right mix of schools into each of these conferences. Yeah, it's fascinating. And look, I, I don't think any of us can be blind to the fact that it now becomes challenging mm -hmm. for some of these other leagues. From the Big Ten's point of view, clearly they're in a great spot. And, and it's impossible to look at this from a Big Ten point of view as anything but just a huge win. I mean, you get two marquee programs, as you said. You're in a great position. You are a national conference. Yes. I mean, the the face of your conference or kind of the perception of your conference has changed dramatically now. Yes, it has. With these last two expansions, you got on the East Coast, on the West Coast, and now in a great position of strength to see if there are other schools that make sense. Obviously, the Big Ten becomes really appealing to them. Yeah, and, and as you really look at this, uh, the last round of expansion, getting Maryland and Rutgers in there, a, lo a lot of people ask the questions about why that geography, but that really cemented you on the East Coast, and now you've yep. got the West Coast in there, but you also look at the, the football product that has gone on in the Big Ten with Ohio State making the playoff, with Michigan making the playoff, with Michigan State being in the college football playoff. I think that's an important part of this, too, because you do have that credibility for being a conference that has really good football, and so it's attractive for people to want to be a part of what's growing here in the Big Ten. And again, truly a national league now spanning coast to coast. More Big Ten today. We showed you USC football a while back. UCLA men's basketball just as impressive. No school has won more titles or had more undefeated seasons than the Bruins have. Also in the top two in Final Fours, weeks at number one, and National Players of the Year. We got a two-time Big Ten Player of the Year with us, our buddy Jim Jackson of Fox Sports. And Jimmy, you know, you left the Big Ten Network a number of years ago. You moved mm -hmm. out to L.A. You thought you'd left the Big Ten behind. Well, the Big Ten <laughs> is coming after you, my friend. Well, what do you make I, of this move? I mean, first of all, man, it's good to be back Uh on camera, even though this is a Zoom, we're not in studio like we used to be uh, chopping it up. But I, I don't know, Dave, we were talking off camera. We kind of seen a lot of this coming down the pipeline with the move that the SEC made, but more importantly, with some moves that were being made um, leading up to this year. You know, all the talk about super conferences and the TV deals. And, you know, I didn't know that it would expand so much where the you know, USC and UCLA will be a part of the Big Ten. That just even sounds weird to talk about. But in today's economics, it makes a lot of sense in regards to a few of those two uh, historic programs in regards to the monetary value it means to either be with the SEC or to be with the Big Ten in this case because of the you know, enormous TV deals that both command. Where do you think all this is headed? Jimmy, in your opinion, do, do you think we're headed to two super conferences? Do you, do you think there's space for other leagues? I think there's space for other leagues in regards to active teams playing, but the big boys are going to be in two leagues. I mean, it looks like it because, you know, I work for Fox. Fox is driving a lot of what's going on with the Big Ten, and ESPN is driving the bus with the SEC. And if you want to, you're talking about the new media rights deal for the Big Ten, Dave, and maybe you correct me if I'm wrong. It may be somewhere in excess of a billion dollars. You're talking about schools being able to benefit from that. I remember when Maryland um, came into the Big Ten, I think the year before they had to drop some varsity sports. But because of the Big Ten deal uh, nationally, but also the Big Ten network deal, they were able to bring some of those sports back. So it's a money thing. Plus, now you have competitive balance in regards to some schools uh, in different regions that now on the national spotlight, you have recruiting. Now, how it works in regards to travel from a USC to, you know, to a Michigan, I don't know. Uh, those guys can figure that out. But it just seems like we're walking down that path, doesn't it? I mean, it certainly seems like, obviously, college basketball, more than 300 teams, as you said. I mean, look, there are going to be a ton of leagues out there, but it does seem yeah. like there is this consolidation of power. And it, it's fascinating to see how it does seem like football is driving the bus but then how basketball fits in becomes really interesting. 
And obviously, when you look at basketball, and the Big Ten got one of the absolute historic brands oh. here. Uh, you cover the Pac-12 mm -hmm. as part of your role at Fox. Obviously, you live in L.A. now, and so you mm -hmm. get to see UCLA up close and personal. Mick Cronin's done a fabulous oh, yeah. job here in the last yes. few years of, of getting this yep. back. So give Big Ten fans a sense of, of what this UCLA program is right now. Uh, on up on the uprise, and that's because of Mick and his dedication to not trying to be UCLA of old, but trying to put his own imprint on it, but understanding how the Pac-12 basketball operates by getting the more athletic, long players, adjustable players. Uh, you know, when he was in Cincinnati, it was more grinded out. Now, defensively, they're going to be better. They're going to shoot the ball from behind the three. Had a bunch of games. You went UCLA, uh, able to cover them. But think about this. You know, yeah, how basketball fits in. I mean, I think Notre Dame may have put the blueprint together when, uh, again, they're still independent, you know, football-wise and play their schedule, but yet they're in the ACC from a basketball perspective. Could we see some things like that where football has its own independence and then basketball remains, you know, where it's I don't know. But having UCLA, the name recognition, okay, into the Big Ten. And that now, USC is no slouch. Now, they may not be UCLA, but from a recruiting perspective, now are you able to tap into the West Coast a little bit more from the Big Ten schools? Uh, what's going to be interesting to me, Dave, I don't know if this is done yet um, in regards to adding still more teams out West uh, to have some natural rivalries uh, built into that, whether it's football or basketball. So we're premature in regards to where we're talking about what the Big Ten is going to be, because this is not to 2024. A lot of things can happen in regards to additional teams coming on board, especially from the Pac-12. Yeah, it's fascinating to see. I mean, you've just seen rumors every single day about how this yeah. might play out. And I, I think maybe a month or two from now, we have a lot more information in terms of what this landscape is going to look like. You mentioned USC. I want you to elaborate on that because I've mentioned this a few times. I mean, they were one win away from making the Final Four a couple of mm -hmm. years ago, Andy Enfield has done a really good job. Again, you get a chance to follow this program. How has he done it? What's different about USC basketball right now? <sighs> Recruiting. I mean, that's what it goes back to. I mean, at, at the end of the day, Dave, you know this. Look at Rutgers. You can be the best X's and O coach in the world. But if you don't have the talent to execute those plays, those designs, then, you know, you're just a good coach. And that's what Andy Enfield has been able to do is fill that roster with a bunch of talented Local guys around the uh, the um, uh, Los Angeles area, California area, recruiting cycles. He came in with a heavy reputation of guys who love to play for him. He's had his ups and downs, but yet and still, you talked about one game away. Again, I just think that the cyclical nature of college basketball right now, teams want to get older, and they're figuring out ways to do that with the transfer you know, portal. And Andy Enfield dipped into that, but also his recruiting. So both UCLA and USC has saw an upstart, an up jump, a jump in their recruiting by getting those players that typically would leave the LA area and go somewhere else. And that's a credit, I think, to the coaching staff and the universities for tapping into something that they used to do. So it just brings a lot of value to both of these Southern California teams. Yeah, it's amazing. You look, they have the number one recruiting class USC does in the Pac-12 mm -hmm. for this year. He signed a five-star recruit in five straight seasons. So uh, that is hard to do. That is really impressive. Hey, yeah. before we let you go, you obviously still cover the Big Ten quite a bit as well. You got a favorite heading into this year? What do you mean? Oh, you said Ohio State? Is that what you said? No. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> well played, my friend. You, you got well, me. <laughs> I got you on that. Yeah. No, you know, it's it's interesting because you, you lost some, a lot of talent in the Big Ten, uh, especially with a lot of young guys, some older guys, Kofi Coburn, you know, but Malachi left Ohio State. He had some departures. Caleb Houston from – I'm not, not – he didn't have the impact, but he still left Michigan. I'm still trying to scour through because it's, you know, you have your preseason stuff with the recruiting classes, but I'm just not for sure yet because you have a lot of young infusion of talent. Illinois is still going to be good. Ohio State has some influx of talent. Michigan does. Uh, Michigan State, I think, is going to be there. I'm still up in the air, bro. I just can't wait for it to start and see how things kind of mature a little bit once we start to see who's who, how players are playing. Because you know how preseason predictions are. I'm so bad at it. It only makes sense. I just stopped trying. Fun stuff. Can't wait to see how it all plays out. 
Jimmy Jackson, always a pleasure, my friend. A Big Ten I'm Network man. original, the great Jimmy Jackson. Yeah. Take care, buddy. Good to, all right, you take care, too, man. Lots of excitement on both sides in regards to the addition of USC and UCLA to the Big Ten. Here's what Lindsey Gottlieb, the USC women's hoops coach, had to say, quote, this move is a bold one that will create unprecedented opportunities for our student athletes to have exposure and competition from coast to coast. There's no question that the USC brand is one of the most powerful in the country, and this is a university that is willing to make groundbreaking change. I look forward to our women's basketball players having a new and exciting future. Among those who will cover that future, Big Ten Network Women's Hoops analyst Christy Winter Scott. And Christy, let's start there with USC. I mean, when you think about the early days of women's basketball, the women of Troy were just fabulous. They have not been as good lately, frankly. How can this help them, this move to the Big Ten? Well, I think it'll be fantastic for them. I know in 1983 and 1984, Cheryl Miller led them to back-to-back -back titles, and their last NCAA appearance was in 2014. So they're well due for the challenge of the Big Ten. So I think it's going to be a, a really good seamless transition for them to enter into this league. I know on the other side of it, for the Pac-12 teams, I know that's going to kind of weaken their conference, and, and that's going to be tough for them. But I think it really enhances the dynamic of the Big Ten Conference. And I think for USC, it could be that punch in the arm. They only had five conference wins last year. They were five and 12. So I think this will really bolster their experience. And I think they can get that coast to coast look that they are, are wanting out of this transition for them. It's incredible. You think of their history though. I mean, you know, Cynthia Cooper and Tina Thompson and Lisa Leslie, I mean, the list goes on and on. Obviously, Cheryl Miller and unbelievable players. So they have a great history, and, and Lindsey Gottlieb is very well respected in the business. So we'll see whether or not this, this does bolster them a little bit. Of the two programs, UCLA has been the more competitive of the two. They've been pretty good. I've made the tournament five of the last six full seasons of women's college hoops. Feels like a program kind of back on the upswing. What are you looking for there? Well, Corey Close is an amazing coach. She's also an amazing human. I, I know her pretty well, and she just has such a great energy about her. Her entire staff is on that same page. But I think with them going to the NCAA tournament in 2021, going out early against a team like Texas, I think they're chomping at the bit to have an opportunity to play in a power conference like the Big Ten and all of the teams that they're going to be able to compete against and, and fight through in the conference play, I think they're going to really be a, a challenge for a lot of the Big Ten teams in terms of the style of game that they play with. And I think that's going to be um, really enhancing what they already have. So I think it's going to be a challenge. I think when you look at um, UCLA and USC, I think it's iron sharpening iron with their addition into the league. But I think for UCLA, I think their upside is tremendous. They were eight and eight in conference play last year, and they're really looking to make that jump. And I think they can do that in the Big Ten. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the history of these programs. That's what really strikes me. And then you think, I mean, Ann Myers obviously playing for UCLA, one of the best in the history of the game. And then can they figure out a way to kind of get it back to, to where it was? And might the Big Ten help them? We know how good the Big Ten has been. It was really good last year. Quick minute or so. Give us a sense of looking ahead in the Big Ten. I mean, it feels like Iowa is the favorite, right? Monica Sinano, obviously, Caitlin Clark coming back. Anyone else you think can, can challenge them? Well, I think, you know, Michigan, I know they had that really historical run for their program last year to the Elite Eight. I know they have a lot of players coming back, but Nas Hillman has graduated. That's going to be uh, something to watch for. Maryland has a lot of different faces, but Brenda Freeze has been known to just come with it, regardless of who is wearing a jersey for Maryland. And I know they're going to be tough always as well. But I think when you're looking at the Big Ten and you're looking at Iowa, Monica Sinano and her decision to return for another year I think that's going to be a major deal for Iowa and Caitlin Clark coming back as a junior this year. I mean, I thought she was a junior when she was a freshman. So, I mean, she has gained so much invaluable experience at a young age. And the way they went out of the tournament last year, I know they were disappointed in that. And the fact that they're all coming back, I think that's the team definitely, like you said, to keep an eye on to win it all.
Yeah, maybe she can work on her shooting range a little bit here at her junior year, perhaps extend it to the other side of, of half court. <laughs> Christy Winter Scott, thanks so much for taking the time out. Looking forward to seeing you cover these teams, of course, the men's teams as well, coming up here in November. Thanks, Christy. Wrap things up here on Big Ten today. We look at last year's Big Ten football standings. Michigan, of course, won the East, ended its longest ever Big Ten title drought of 16 years by topping the West champ, Iowa. Michigan State and Ohio State both won New Year's Six Bowls. Top three really separated themselves in the East. The West was a bit closer with Minnesota, Wisconsin, Purdue, all just a game back of the Hawkeyes. Joshua Perry rejoining me as we will dive into this year. Let's start in the East. Mm -hmm. How do you assess the top? Is it just Ohio State and Michigan? Is there a clear delineation there? Do you think anyone else is in that discussion? The East is, is certainly going to be interesting this year. I, I do think it's Ohio State and Michigan. And Michigan's now in a position of being the hunted in the Big Ten East. It's not something that they had been in a long time. But I don't think that changes a single thing that they do within that program. Jim Harbaugh is a guy who wants his football team to be tough, and he wants them to play with enthusiasm unknown to mankind. They're going to do that. But as you start to assess the facts, it's going to be interesting throughout training camp in the beginning of the year to see exactly what happens with this Michigan team. You lose your defensive coordinator in Mike McDonald, and he was instrumental in Michigan's success last year. Then you look at Aiden Hutchinson, David Ojabo, Dax Hill, uh, Josh Ross, as players that were mainstays on that defense that won't be there any longer. So you have to be able to fill that production in those voids that exist there. You flip it over to the offensive side, lost two offensive linemen, lost Hassan Haskins, which is a really big one in the run game, although I think their, their running back room is going to be pretty daggone good this year. But they got a little bit of a quarterback controversy. Cade McNamara, J.J. McCarthy, two guys who we know can play. Cade's probably the safer pick, but J.J. McCarthy provides this explosion to this offense that uh, you don't typically see from Michigan offenses. So as you start to assess the facts, I'm not exactly sure it's a direct path from them, but they have really, really good pieces on that roster. As you start to look at Ohio State, C.J. Stroud, Heisman finalist, you got your quarterback back. Biggest piece in college football to have that guy solidified. Then you got Travion Henderson, who's going to be really good. We saw what Marvin Harrison Jr. could do in the Rose Bowl, Emeka Ibuka, Julian Fleming, some of the wide receiver talent out there. I don't think people are really worried about that. The questions for Ohio State come on defense, where they clean house on that defensive staff except for Larry Johnson. Now you've got... Uh, Jim Knowles in as your new defensive coordinator. His philosophy is let's play offense on defense. We're not going to sit around and let offenses read us. We're going to make them react to what uh, they're doing defensively. Very curious to see what that's going to look like in practice. I got to cover them in the spring game. The guys were flying around. It looks like they're learning the defense, but there are going to be some bumps in the road for Ohio State as well. Those are the top two teams in the East, in my opinion. It's hard to look at Ohio State's defense as it was not just last year, but really to, to a certain extent the year before. And I know mm -hmm. they played for a national championship mm -hmm. the year before. But still, in terms of points per game allowed, those are two of the five worst defenses in school history. So can they play at a championship level? Can they be close to a championship of those defenses? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. but, but I think to, to take that step... They're going to have to improve, and, and Jim Knowles is a huge part of that equation. So it'll be fascinating to see. Is there a dark horse? Is there someone else? I mean, look, Michigan State and, and yeah. Penn State are going to be in the discussion. A anyone else beyond that you think could, could at least make some noise? Yeah, Michigan State, Penn State, I think, are two teams that are, are, are tough to judge at this point. You've got returning quarterbacks. So you're losing some production. Like the defense for Penn State, don't know what the defense for Michigan State is going to look like. I think those teams will be competitive. Maryland is the one, if you're looking for a dark horse in the East, that can make a little bit of noise. Leah Tungavailoa is returning. This guy is explosive, and he doesn't have a conscience. And I don't mean that as an insult, but when things go wrong for this kid, you may see him pout for a second, but he just goes back out on the football field, and he tries to make plays. So that's exactly what you want. Then you start to boil down some of their offensive talent. Rakim Jarrett, Dante Demas, Jayshon Jones. You really like what they have in terms of playmakers that you can throw the ball to if you're Tonga Vailoa. So for this team, I think offensively, they're in a really good spot. Got some good returning pieces on defense. The thing that always hurt them, and it's the thing that we talk about all the time with Maryland, undisciplined football. It's the penalties that get them. It's the plays where, uh, you know, guys are, are out of alignment where you know where they should be and they're not. That really hurt them. If they can clean up the little things, I think this team can make some noise. 13th in the Big Ten in turnover margin, mm -hmm. kind of to your point. I mean, those are 
the things that really good teams don't do. I do worry about defense. I mean, they gave up nearly 39 points per game in conference play, and the portal really hurt them mm -hmm. defensively. They lost some star power there. But I hear, yeah, that offense, that wide receiver room. It's ridiculous. Maybe outside of Columbus, it might be the best in the Big Ten. I mean, it's really good. Potentially could be. And, I mean, you're looking at a really good quarterback throwing the football, right. too. And, and those two things work in tandem. So, uh, offensively, there will be some fireworks for Maryland. What about the West? Do, do you see it as kind of a, a, as jumbled in kind of the way that it was last year, or do you see a clear-cut favorite? There? No, it, it's pretty jumbled uh, as it was last year, but if I had to pick a favorite right now, I'd actually go with Purdue, and it's because I like what they have going on at quarterback. You've got Aiden O'Connell, who I thought had a phenomenal year last year. Again, a guy who people didn't have very high expectations for. All he did was go out there and make plays. David Bell was a huge part of that. He is not returning to this team. He's going to be playing for the Cleveland Browns in the fall. But uh, you still got some good pieces, Brock Thompson, TJ Sheffield, that you can throw the football to. The other part of this Purdue team uh, was their defense last year. You talk about a team that took some steps forward defensively. That was them because, you know, previous couple of years, it, it didn't really look good. And when we watched them out at training camp, you could see the intensity, the way that the coaches wanted those guys to play. They had a very high standard there. Uh, so they're going to have to keep up the defensive production. But I think from an offensive standpoint, having that quarterback back is a huge piece for them. It is amazing how much better they were defensively yeah. last year. I give a ton of credit to that staff. Remember, they shared a lot of yes. the defensive coordinator say, three duties. Three defensive coordinators. And, and had four teams that they held to 10 points or fewer, first yeah. time since 1978. I, they were really good. The, the kind of old standbys that you think of in the West are Wisconsin mm -hmm. and Iowa, although Northwestern's also won it two of the last four years, sure. but they, they were off off the charts bad offensively and defensively, frankly, last year. So so let's focus on Wisconsin and Iowa. W what do you think of those two? You, you know, these two teams you can never count out in the West because they are teams that don't do anything too cute offensively, and they play phenomenal on the defensive side of the ball. When you look at Wisconsin, Graham Mertz, we've kind of been waiting for him to take that next step as a quarterback. Is this going to be the year where he can really branch out and do that? Uh, we'll have to see, but you, you start to look at their running back room. Braylon Allen, he was really, really good last year. And then you got Ches Malusi, who was also a good piece for them. Again, defense, I think they're going to be solid. So that's a team that you're going to look at and say, okay, I might, you know, uh, put a little confidence in them. And then as you get to Iowa, it's a team that won the West last year, so you certainly have to give them credit. It's the same thing. It's a team that's built off of defense, and that, that defense was ridiculous in terms of their ability to take the football away. Those are game-changing plays, and especially when your offense is trying to find footing. Uh, so I think for them, it's about quarterback development as well. You got Spencer Petrus returning. Alex Padilla played some time there. I think Petrus is probably in the driver's seat. Um, and, and so you want to make sure that he takes that next step as a quarterback as well. But those two defenses, I think you can really hang your hat on. No doubt. You know Iowa's going to be good on defense yeah. for seven straight years in the top 20 in the nation in scoring defense. Wisconsin lost a lot, particularly at linebacker. They but did. Again, you look at Jim Leonard and yeah. you just got to say. No, I mean, they just keep developing those yeah, guys. He knows yeah. who's doing and, and, and they'll be fine. I think for both of them, it's kind of similar themes, right? Yes. Are they going to be able to throw the ball? Is that's, the that's really what it's going to come down to. Going to be good enough for, for those two. Is there a dark horse there that you're looking at in the West? Minnesota Gophers is a dark horse. And uh, when they were at their best a couple years ago, it was Tanner Morgan and Kirk Shiraka. Kirk Shiraka's back into this equation. We're going to see that RPO offense that they were really good at. Tanner Morgan, uh, obviously a guy when you watch football games that – you want to root for because all that he's been through and the type of leader that he is for that offense. But it seemed like he did take a step back last year. So, again, for him to get back up to that level. But you've got Chris Ottman bell there. You've got uh, Dylan Wright, who's going to be a really good player as well. The X factor when we talk about Minnesota, though, is a guy named Mo Ibrahim. Hadn't talked about him a lot because he was hurt last year. Could be the best running back in the country. There's some really good running backs in this conference nationally. There are going to be some guys that have a spotlight could be the best running back in the nation if he comes back from that injury 100%. And so I think that combination of having him in the backfield, a downhill tough runner who's going to get you the yards that you need, plus a quarterback getting back with the offensive coordinator that he had success with a couple of years ago, that's a team that could make some moves over there in the West. Let's not forget how good the defense was. It was last really year. good. They were third in the nation in yeah. total defense. Now, they lost a lot there, too. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the question mark becomes – are the guys that they added in the portal good enough to step in right away yep. and, and be at that same level? But you think about where that defense was, and 
2020 was such a weird year. It was year. a tough year. <laughs> so, but man, I mean, there was there were times where you watch their defense, they're just like, they, they couldn't stop anything. No. And to think about the improvements they made last year is mind-boggling. No, it certainly is, but I think that also speaks to what those guys believed in their locker room and some of the leaders that they had. Boye Mafia is one of my favorite players in the conference, and that was a guy who you know is going to be front and center for that team. We are going to talk a whole lot more about this coming your way. Big Ten Media Days. Coming up! July 26 <laughs> and 27, less than three weeks away. Joshua and I will be there along with Jerry DiNardo, Howard Griffith, 